Gay science, suggests Nietzsche's immoralism and his revaluation of values. Superficially. That serious thinking does not have to be stodgy, heavy, dusty, or, in one word, Teutonic. The art of poetry. Science, suggests seriousness, discipline, and rigor. The self-overcoming of nihilism. A self-conquest that requires no recourse beyond science. Science, scientific thinking. And scientific hypotheses are for Nietzsche not necessarily stodgy and academic or desiccated. We have to give birth to our thoughts out of our pain and, like mothers, endow them with all we have of blood, heart, fire, pleasure, passion, agony, conscience, fate, and catastrophe. Life that means for us constantly transforming all that we are into light and flame also everything that wounds us, we simply can do no other. Only great pain is the ultimate liberator of the spirit, being the teacher of the great suspicion that turns every you into an X, a real, genuine X, that is the letter before the penultimate one I doubt that such pain makes us better, but I know that it makes us more profound. Even love of life is still possible, only one loves differently. It is the love for a woman that causes doubts in us. Will to truth, to truth at any price, this youthful madness in the love of truth, have lost their charm for us, for that we are too experienced, too serious, too merry, too burned, too profound. We no longer believe that truth remains truth when the veils are withdrawn, we have lived too much to believe this. Joke, cunning, and revenge. Dialogue. Was I ill? Have I got well? Who was my doctor? Can you tell? Oh. My memory is rotten. B. Only now you're truly well. Those are well who have forgotten. To a light lover. If you don't want your eyes and mind to fade. Pursue the sun while walking in the shade. Interpretation. Interpreting myself. I always read. Myself into my books. I clearly need. Some help. But all who climb on their own way carry my image, too, into the breaking day. My hardness. A hundred steps I have to climb. I must ascend. But here you groan. You're cruel. Are we made of stone? A hundred steps I have to climb. Who wants to be a step? Not one. Consolation for beginners. See the child lost among swine. Helpless. He can't even talk. He is always, always crying. Will he ever learn to walk? Don't despair. Soon he will treat. You to dances. It is said. Once he can stand on his feet. He will soon stand on his head. The pious retort. God loves us. Because we are made by him. But man made God. To say the refined. Should he not love what he designed? Should he, because he made him, now deny him? That inference limps, it has a cloven mind. Without envy. His look is free of envy, hence you laud him, he does not notice whether you applaud him, he has the eagle's eye for what is far, he does not see you, he sees only scars. The thorough who get to the bottom of things. A seeker. I. Oh. Please be still. I merely heavy weigh many a pound. I fall, and I keep falling till. At last, I reach the ground. Human. All too human, a book. You're sad and shy when looking at the past. But trust the future when yourself you trust, are you some kind of eagle in pursuit? Or just Minerva's favorite hoot hoot hoot? Realistic painters. True to nature all the truth, that's art. This hallowed notion is a threadbare fable. Infinite is nature's smallest part. They paint what happens to delight their heart. And what delights them? What to paint they're able. Choosy taste. If it depended on my choice. I think it might be great. To have a place in paradise. Better yet outside the gate. The skeptic speaks. Half of your life is done. The hand moves on, you feel a sudden chill. You have roamed long, and run. And sought, and found not why this sudden frill. Half of your life is done. And it was pain and error through and through. Why do you still seek on? Precisely this I seek, the reason why. Star morals. Call the star's orbit to pursue. What is the darkness? Star, to you. Roll on in bliss, traverse this age. It's misery far from you and strange. Let farthest world your light secure. Pity is sin you must abjure. But one command is yours, be pure. Book 1. Whether I contemplate men with benevolence or with an evil eye, to do what is good for the preservation of the human race. But merely because nothing in them is older, stronger, more inexorable, and unconquerable than this instinct because this instinct constitutes the essence of our species. Even the most harmful man may really be the most useful when it comes to the preservation of the species. Evil belongs to the most amazing economy of the preservation of the species. It is on the whole extremely foolish. Still, 
it is proven that it has preserved our race so far. The species is everything, one is always none has become part of humanity, and this ultimate liberation and irresponsibility has become accessible to all at all times. Man has to believe, to know. From time to time why he exists, his race cannot flourish without a periodic trust in life without faith in reason in life. And again, and again a human race will decree from time to time, not only laughter and gay wisdom but the tragic, too, with all its sublime unreason, belongs among the means and necessities of the preservation of the species. The great majority of people lacks an intellectual conscience. Some folly keeps persuading me that every human being has this feeling, simply because he is human. This is my type of injustice. One cannot comprehend how anyone could risk his health and honor for the sake of a passion for knowledge. What preserves the species? The good men are in all ages those who dig the old thoughts. Digging deep and getting them to bear fruit the farmers of the spirit. But eventually all land is exploited and the plowshare of evil must come again and again. The evil instincts are expedient, species-preserving, and indispensable to as high a degree as the good ones, their function is merely different. Whoever feels that his dignity is incompatible with the thought of being the instrument but who nevertheless wants to or must be such an instrument before himself and before the public, requires pompous principles that can be mouthed at any time, principles of some unconditional obligation to which one may submit without shame. We are, all of us, growing volcanoes that approach the hour of their eruption, but how near or distant that is. Nobody knows not even God. Consciousness is the last and latest development of the organic and hence also what is most unfinished and unstrong. Consciousness gives rise to countless errors that lead an animal or man to perish sooner than necessary, those who have comprehended that so far, we have incorporated only our errors and that all our consciousness relates to errors. What if pleasure and displeasure were fifty tied together that whoever wanted to have as much as possible of one must also have as much as possible of the other if you diminish and lower the level of human pain, you also have to diminish and lower the level of their capacity for joy. Benefiting and hurting others are ways of exercising one's power upon others, whether benefiting or hurting others involves sacrifices for us does not affect the ultimate value of our actions. His is a sacrifice that is offered for our desire for power or for the purpose of preserving our feeling of power. Our pleasure in ourselves tries to maintain itself by again and again changing something new into ourselves, that is what possession means. To become tired of some possession means tiring of ourselves. We had forgotten that some greatness, like some goodness, wants to be beheld only from a distance and by all means only from below, not from above, otherwise, it makes no impression. There is no trick that enables us to turn a poor virtue into a rich and overflowing one, but we can reinterpret its poverty into a necessity so that it no longer offends us when we see it and we no longer sulk at fate on its account. Some kinds of hatred, jealousy, stubbornness, mistrust, hardness, avarice, and violence do not belong among the favorable conditions without which any great growth even of virtue is scarcely possible. For society as a whole the loss of even the best individual is merely a small sacrifice. Too bad that such sacrifices are needed. But it would be far worse if the individual would think otherwise and considered his preservation and development more important than his work in the service of society. Thus, one feels sorry for the youth not for his own sake but because a devoted instrument, ruthless against itself a so-called good man has been lost to society by his death. Perhaps one gives some thought to the question whether it would have been more useful for society if he had been less ruthless against himself and had preserved himself longer. But one considers the other advantage that a sacrifice has been made and that the attitude of the sacrificial animal has once again been confirmed for all to see greater and of more lasting significance. The praise of virtue is the praise of something that is privately harmful the praise of instincts that deprive a human being of his noblest selfishness and the strength for the highest autonomy. How often I see that blindly raging industriousness does create wealth and reap honors while at the same time depriving the organs of their subtlety, which alone would make possible the enjoyment of wealth and honors, the most industrious of all ages ours does not know how to make anything of all its industriousness and money, except always still more money and still more industriousness, for it requires more genius to spend than to acquire. Well, we shall have our grandchildren. If this education succeeds, then every virtue of an individual is a public utility and a private disadvantage, measured against the supreme private goal probably some impoverishment of the spirit and the senses or even a premature decline. The virtues of obedience, chastity, filial piety, and justice. The signs of corruption as soon as corruption sets in anywhere superstition becomes rank. And the previous common faithful of a people becomes pale and powerless against it. In times of exhaustion that tragedy runs through houses and streets, that great love and great hatred are born. And that the flame of knowledge flares up into the sky. The art of wounding and torturing others with words and looks reaches its supreme development in times of corruption when morals decay those men emerge whom one calls tyrants, they are the precursors and as it were the precocious harbingers of individuals. Only a little while later this fruit of fruits hangs yellow and mellow from the tree of people and the tree existed only for the sake of these fruits. Then, once decay has reached its climax along with the infighting of all sorts of tyrants, the Caesar always appears, 
the final tyrant who puts an end to the weary struggle for sale rule by putting weariness to work for himself. He tyrant or Caesar understands the rights of the individual even in his excesses and has a persona, interest in advocating and even abetting a bolder private morality. The times of corruption are those when the apples fall from the tree, I mean the individuals, for they carry the seeds of the future and are the authors of the spiritual colonization and origin of new states and communities. Corruption is merely a nasty word for the autumn of a people. The weak type of the dissatisfied has a sensitivity for making life more beautiful and profound, to provide opiates and narcotic consolations thus it assures the continuation of real misery. The strong type, has a sensitivity for making life better and safer. Not predestined for knowledge there is a stupid humility and those afflicted with it are altogether unfit to become devotees of knowledge. As soon as a person of this type perceives something striking. He turns on his heel, as it were, and says to himself, you have made a mistake. What is the matter with your senses? This cannot, may not, be the truth. And then, instead of looking and listening again, more carefully. He runs away from the striking thing. For his inner canon says, I do not want to see anything that contradicts the prevalent opinion. Am I called to discover new truths? There are too many old ones. As it is. What is life, life that is, continually shedding something that wants to die? Life that is, being cruel and inexorable against everything about us that is growing old and weak and not only about us. Life that is, then, being without reverence for those who are dying, who are wretched. Who are ancient. Constantly being a murderer. And yet old Moses said, Thou shalt not kill. What does the man of renunciation do? He strives for a higher world. He wants to fly further and higher than all men of affirmation he throws away much that would encumber his flight, including not a little that he esteems and likes, he sacrifices it to his desire for the heights. Famous men, like all politicians, never choose allies and friends without ulterior motives. Man is now more evil than ever before. Why should man be more mistrustful and evil now? Because he now has and needs a science. During the last centuries science has been promoted, partly because it was by means of science that one hoped to understand God's goodness and wisdom, like Newton, partly because one believed in the absolute utility of knowledge, and especially in the most intimate association of morality, knowledge, and happiness, like Voltaire, partly because one thought that in science one possessed and loved something unselfish, harmless, self-sufficient, and truly innocent, in which man's evil impulses had no part. The most common man feels that nobility cannot be improvised and that one has to honor in it the fruit of long periods of time. But the lack of higher manners and the notorious vulgarity of manufacturers with their ruddy, fat hands give him the idea that it is only accident and luck that have elevated one person above another. Well, then, he reasons, let us try accident and luck. Let us throw the dice. And thus, socialism is born. Against remorse a thinker sees his own actions as experiments and questions as attempts to find out something. Success and failure are for him answers above all. To be annoyed or feel remorse because something goes wrong that he leaves to those who act because they have received orders and who have to reckon with a beating when his lordship is not satisfied with the result. Looking for work in order to be paid, in civilized countries today almost, all men are at one in doing that. For all of them work is a means and not an end in itself. Hence, they are not very refined in their choice of work, if only it pays well. But there are, if only rarely, men who would rather perish than work without any pleasure in their work. They are choosy, hard to satisfy, and do not care for ample rewards. If the work itself is not the reward of rewards. Even those men of leisure who spend their lives hunting, traveling, or in love affairs and adventures. All of these desire work and misery if only it is associated with pleasure. And the hardest. Most difficult work if necessary. Otherwise. Their idleness is resolute. Even if it spei one s impoverishment, dishonor, and danger to life and limb. They do not fear boredom as much as work without pleasure, they actually require a lot of boredom if their work is to succeed. For thinkers and all sensitive spirits. Boredom is that disagreeable windless calm of the soul that precedes a happy voyage and cheerful winds. They have to bear it and must wait for its effect on them. Precisely this is what lesser natures cannot achieve by any means. To ward off boredom at any cost is vulgar, no less than work without pleasure. It is essential to know the fictitious and fanciful motives to which men ascribe their conduct. For their inner happiness and misery has come to men depending on their faith in this or that motive not by virtue of the actual motives. The latter are of second order interest. The general lack of experience of pain of both kinds and one he relative rarity of the sight of anyone who is suffering have an important consequence, pain is now hated much more than was the case formerly, one speaks much worse of it, indeed, one considers the existence of the mere thought of pain scarcely endurable and turns it into a reproach against the whole of existence. 
there is a recipe against pessimistic philosophers and the excessive sensitivity that seems to me the real misery of the present age but this recipe may sound too cruel and might itself be counted among the signs that lead people to judge that existence is something evil. Well, the recipe against this misery is, misery. Where the good begins where the poor power of the eye can no longer see the evil impulse as such because it has become too subtle, man posits the realm of goodness, and the feeling that we have now entered the realm of goodness excites all those impulses which had been threatened and limited by the evil impulses, like the feeling of security, of comfort, of benevolence. What makes a person noble? Certainly not making sacrifices, for those frantic with lust also make sacrifices. Certainly not following some passion. For there are contemptible passions. Certainly not doing something for others. Without selfishness rather, the passion involves the use of a rare and singular standard and almost a madness, the feeling of heat in things that feel cold to everybody else, the discovery of values for which no scales have been invented yet, offering sacrifices on altars that are dedicated to an unknown god, a courage without any desire for honors, a self-sufficiency that overflows and gives to men and things. When I think of the craving to do something, I realize that they must have a craving to suffer and to find in their suffering a probable reason for action, for deeds. Neediness is needed. If these people who crave distress felt the strength inside themselves to benefit themselves and to do something for themselves internally, then they would also know how to create for themselves.